My name is Deirdre McNabb, and I'm the former state president, and now I'm very excited to say that I'm the chair of the Natural Resources Committee for the state, which is my big passion. So it's been a, it's a thrilling journey. We're just at the beginning on that, although the League has been active on natural resources for many decades. But that's not the topic today. The topic of our conversation today is, and it's going to be an interactive program, so don't get too relaxed in your chair. <laughs> it's leadership. You know, I this is this is a rule of thumb, but it's not true in every case. But I find over the years of working with league members, so often people are reluctant leaders. They come and they say, you know, I want to help. I'm not sure what I can do, but I really care about this issue. And one of my favorite anecdotes league-related is Eleanor Roosevelt, who came and gave a speech to the League of Women Voters many years ago. And at the end of the program, after all the questions and answers, and she saw the level of energy and enthusiasm, she said to the leadership of the meeting, I'd really like to be able to help. I'm not really sure how I can do that, but I'd love to be able to help, which is something I hear a lot. And they said to Eleanor Roosevelt, Mrs. First Lady, We'd love you to go and speak in public on these issues. And she said, I don't know about the issues to be able to stand up and speak. And in famous league history, they said, we will teach you. <laughs> and of course, she went on to become one of the most famous public speakers in America. And really, the eyes and the ears for Franklin Roosevelt. So that's been my experience over the years, is I often get people who come up who are passionate on the issues, but aren't quite sure how to dig in, and many times don't see themselves as being a leader at all. They just want to be really in the, in the truth, in the, in the ditches. They're ready to take the shrapnel. But that's the exciting thing about this organization, is we suddenly find ourselves very quickly as a leader, someone who is making amazing change. And the woman behind the camera right here, Patty Brigham, is a perfect example of that. Because it was just, was it two or three years ago? Two. Two years ago, Patty came and said, I really care about this gun issue in Florida. This just can't stand. This is outrageous what's happening. And Patty, I don't think, ever had a vision of herself doing what's happened and the success you've had and the success that you will have still to come. But she's been able to really turn this state around on key pieces of legislation like not allowing guns on campus and not allowing open carry and many more issues related to gun safety. So by the way, Patty is the first vice president of the state board and continues to hold her, her uh, crown as the gun safety queen. So <laughs> the anti Marion Hammer, which is wonderful. But Patty is really a good example of someone who didn't come in, I don't think, feeling too prepared about where she was going to go, but she knew she wanted to make a difference. And that is really a common defining strand, really. People get involved usually because of outrage over hanging chads, uh, outrage over millions of dead fish in the Indian River, outrage over corruption, outrage over ending early voting and taking the Sunday before election day away, outrage about asking the League of Women Voters to get a voter registration form filled out and then put their running shoes on and take it immediately to the supervisor of election. But we get outraged and we want to do something and the League is a platform for us. So today's session is really to talk about how you can develop your inner leader because rarely do people stand up and say, I'm going to lead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. They, they know they care, but they come to the lead wanting to know how to make a difference. And leadership is the key way. Taking the lead, just like Patty did and so many others, taking the lead on issues and moving progress forward. So what I would like to, to start out with, I'm going to... I'm a big one in when, when, when we do this to move quickly, not, not long editorials, but what are
are your attributes of the favorite leaders that you've worked with, whether it's at work or whether it's volunteer? What are the elements that make someone fun and exciting and rewarding to work with? So we're just gonna, everybody's gonna talk, so you have to start thinking. I'm not gonna start with you, Liz. Can you just off the top of your head? And you know what, I would, because I would like to also practice our public speaking. So stand up, turn, look at the group, and emphatically say what it is, okay? <laughs> Good. The thing that I most admire in some of the leaders, leadership qualities that I see in people is the lack of fear of failure. Failing is not an option to a good leader. Not to say that they are not, uh, that they don't know it's possible, it's that they don't consider that possibility in their actions. Okay, great. Courage, courage. Very good. <laughs> and you know what? When you stand up, say your name and then say okay. the attribute. Okay? Maura right. Smith, local league, uh, Orange County. Um, I think, I mean, it's the flip Gotta side. Gotta go faster. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just okay. come out. The flip side of what I don't like about some leaders is that they make the decisions and they just announce it. I like leaders that say we're all inclusive here and I want to look. So consensus. So we've heard courage, consensus. Well, and you can say again if something you Mary Duskin, uh, Tommy Charlie. And this is Dems unimportant, but sense of humor. <laughs> Good one. Good one. Good one. Good one. Good one. Okay. Lorraine Zimmerman, Palm Beach County. I like intelligence, but I also like the common sense. Mm -hmm. Good one. Harley Houston, Palm Beach County. Mine is authenticity. Yeah. Uh, Susie Peace, Volusia County. I like the way um, Patty, I'm using this handle, connects with us. She communicates immediately. If we ask something, she finds the answer. So the humility that she has is wonderfully inclusive. Good point. Connectivity and humility. Thank you. Lindy Freeman, Orange County. Um, Referring back to authenticity and being democratic, there's truly democratic leaders and there are mock democratic leaders. Mock democratic leaders should be able to say at all costs. What they do is they, they gather the money and they say, I really need your input. But really, the truth is your brother stands. Okay, so true authenticity. Thank yeah. you. I think a leader needs a sense of curiosity that they should never end with what they currently know, but always find more. And the other thing is to show appreciation for the people that work with you. Very good. Kay Lawton, Para, St. Petersburg, area. And I believe it needs to be passionate. Passion. Passion. <laughs> Robin Cook from Sanibel, and I, I think that a very important part of leadership is to be able to frame the issues for the group and rise above emotion and minor details and frame issues for when meetings take place and then move it along and to come to some connect consensus. And uh, sometimes there is not a, a consensus that's natural, so you just have to make a decision. And if the group doesn't want to, Thank you, Robin. Sarah? Sarah Isaac, Orange County League. Um, Deirdre's actually my example of this, not to like um, flatter you, Deirdre, but you are one of my great leaders, which is that how she makes, how a leader makes other people feel, right? Instead of, I'm the great leader, you need to listen to me, and Deirdre always says, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, I can't. And she's like, yes, you can. <laughs> so that's a Thank great leader. Sarah, that's a nice one. Yeah, yeah, Sarah. Um, Sarah, wasn't there a part of your introduction that you had? Oh, a new president for the Orange County. Oh, wow. Wow. Getting my sea legs. Wow. Uh, Theo Webster, I think it's the ability to listen to other people and to take what you hear and incorporate that into your strategy and your action. That's the great cost of the Space Coast chapter. I think that vision, having a vision. You don't necessarily have to have all the steps, but you have this vision. You see it there, and you focus on that, and that that energy drives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I am 
and Deborah Mishley, Space Coast, recently membership board. Um, I think authenticity um, is the most important, as you know. It's, it's, it includes being honest, but it includes being clear, you know, and so you know if you really want to get on board um, with that person. Because mm -hmm. I'm leery of charismatic people um, because they may not all be honest. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, if I understood the question, well, you have to introduce yourself first. Thank you very much. I'm Teresa Thomas. I am the treasurer of the state board. Uh, if I understood the question, we are defining leadership. Yes. Um, leadership is, for me, several things. Um, and each of you all have spoken to it, but to put it very concisely for me, it's um, sharing a vision, having a shared vision, having fostered communication so that people can have and understand that even though we are disagreeing, we're still respecting each other. We don't always have to agree, so we have to foster trusted communication um, as well as you can do it, Spirit, making sure that that person... Okay, I'm cutting you off. That's so, great. Thank but you. That is that's it. good. <laughs> Patty, thank you. Sorry. That's good. No, that's good. I just got to keep it going. Patty? Uh, well, I would say definitely the ability to inspire. If, if you don't inspire, you're not going to get the attention of those you're speaking with. So I think inspiration in a leader is extremely important. Well, I can see by the list, because it's a really good list, that we've got a lot of people who've thought about this and who have an understanding of and are leaders themselves to be able to understand all the different components that, that make up a good leader. And I'm going to just add a few, and I'm not sure they're too much different from the ones that you've contributed, but <clears throat> I think enthusiasm in a leader is very important. You have to give people the sense that there is a motor running in you. You can't, you know, it's, it's, if you're talking, trying to inspire her, who's seen the movie Harvey Milk? Anybody? I, I recommend it. He starts with his introduction in front of a lot of people, and here's how he introduces himself. My name is Harvey Milk, and I'm here to recruit you! <laughs> now that's someone who has energy. He was running for mayor of San Francisco, which he won, and he really made a revolution in, in his leadership. But you have to get some energy. If you don't exude it naturally, rev yourself up like a boxer before your board meetings or your gatherings because you want some pent up energy in there. You want people to see the flame. That's important. The other element that I think is very, very important for a successful leader is focus. I can't tell you how often We've been working on a campaign or an issue, and people will come up with to you. There were authors in Washington who used to call them the nattering nabobs of negativism. Do you remember that from decades ago? The nattering nabobs of negativism. That was spiritual. <laughs> they are around us, and we even have some in the league who will say this is not going to work, this sounds a little bit too partisan, this is that, whatever it is. As a leader, you have to be able to listen, to reflect and see if there is veracity in it, but you have to keep the positive focus. And then the third element is perseverance. You look at the great leaders through history. Susan B. Anthony in her last speech said, failure is not an option when it came to the right for women to vote. Winston Churchill was invited to give a commencement address at a university, and he stood up and he said, I'll be brief. Never, 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 never give up. And he sat down. <laughs> Perseverance is very important, and focus is very important. The other element besides negativism with volunteers often is people will come up to you with a different approach or a side issue or another way of doing it. And you really have to, like many of you said, you have to be a listener, you have to 
and listen, but at the end of the day, as the leader, the group is looking to you to maintain focus. So a lot of times at a board meeting, I'm sure it's happened, how many of you have sat or are sitting on a board? I'm sure many of you, I know many of you are present, so. You will often have people raise an issue at a board meeting, which can derail it. You know, like, should we let men in the league? Should we change our name? You know, should we spend $10,000 on this? Bucket list. The chair, the president, needs to say that's a very interesting conversation. We need to have it. We're going to put it in the bucket list. If we have time at the end of the meeting, we'll come back to it. So you have to maintain focus. And if you're not the president, you can still offer to your president Maybe that's something we could put on a bucket list to talk about later, because nobody wants to sit in important meetings and they can go on for two or three hours and that's not productive. Keep the focus, focus, focus. Whether you're a president, a board member, or a chair, or a volunteer, focus is very, very important. And then finally, I would say follow through. It's really easy to come up with good ideas, and many times people will volunteer to do something and there's no follow through. So as a leader, I really seem, you know, some people talk about themselves as a golden retriever or a Labrador or I'm a border collie. And you have to be a border collie if you're a leader. Your job is to keep everybody moving in the right direction. Yeah, so you have to follow up, follow up follow up and persevere and call gently and say, Patty, did you have a chance to complete X, Y, Z? <laughs> Patty probably already completed it and did, you know, ABC too. But many people need that urging because guess what? We're volunteers and we have lives. We have relatives. We have friends. We have hobbies. So we all need gentle pushing. So perseverance is very important in a nice way. Uh, another attribute that I want to talk about is delegating. How many of your, you would identify yourselves as being good delegators, asking other people to help? Raise your hand if you're a good delegator. I am. One, two, three. Okay, write that down on your list. You need to look for helpers and people who can, you know, it's like Hercules. We're not Hercules. We can't pick up a huge boulder by ourselves. But if we enlist a whole team of people, we can move mountains. We can build the pyramids. But we need to be able to look for helpers and to delegate parts of it. And you know what? It's a lot like public speaking. A lot of times people don't think that people want to hear what they have to say. They do. But people want to be asked to help. They do. They want to be part of the solution. That's why we all pay $65 or $100 to be a league member, because we're worker bees. We want to make a difference. So give people that opportunity by delegating and by pushing up a job. Because people 
people from all over went on these trips. But my point here is new ideas and openness to new ideas. Let's not be an organization that says that's not the way we've ever done it before. Let's be an organization that says, why not? Let's try it. Let's see if it works. So, and then another element that I think is important is the ability to give constructive, I'm not going to call it criticism, I'm going to say feedback. Because we are all volunteers. So how does one give our fellow volunteers constructive feedback? And one of my favorite tips on that, has anybody heard of Pat Summit? Who, who likes women's oh, basketball? Oh, basketball. <laughs> yeah. She was the coach for the University of Tennessee, which had the winningest, winningest women's basketball in the country. And she wrote a book, and she had a tip in it that I have always found very positive. Someone said, what do you ascribe your success to? And she said, PNP. Anybody know what that means? PNP, positive, negative, positive. I use it with my kids all the time. Positive, negative, positive. So you say, Patty, I love the way you delivered that speech when you spoke to the legislature. It was fantastic, and they were all ears. You might want to think next time about not saying um at the end of every sentence. <laughs> but, but your construction of it, your power, you know, the conciseness was outstanding. So you see how you were able to sandwich in and I don't mean to pick on Patty because she doesn't use the word. Um, <laughs> I do sometimes. <laughs> but the point is, there are ways to deliver something constructive and you put it in a sandwich of nice things. Why? Because when someone says something nice to you, your ears open up and you're like, oh, thank you. <coughs> and then you're still listening when they come in with the critique part, the review, and then they end on a positive note. And so that's how she was able to motivate her players but also coach them into improving. And it is really amazing, because I'm sure you've had the experience of giving someone some critical feedback. It's difficult. It's difficult. So this is a way to do it in a very positive, and still have them walk away like, I did a great job. I am going to work on that on part. So that is a, is a good tip I, I've always felt for constructive criticism. And then, very importantly, is hope. Giving your volunteers hope and staying positive. Because as Corinne knows, because she's been involved with the league here in Florida a long time, our campaigns take a long time. We worked on fair districts for 70 years. This gun issue isn't going away. It's been going for decades, and it's going to go. We are, we are always going to be fully employed as volunteers in Florida. And success doesn't come overnight. So you have to be optimistic and you have to give people hope. You think about Winston Churchill's speeches. He, you know, how he uplifted his whole country as they were being bombed in London is an amazing story of how he was able to always see the light at the end of the tunnel and give his people hope that we, a brighter day was going to come and we are going to win this fight. And so a successful leader really needs to, again, build up that internal flame and make sure that their, your volunteers are inspired and hopeful. Okay, uh, a couple of tips. One thing that I have noticed over the years that really can be a problem maker, has anybody had a situation in their league with emails? where someone will say something to a large group of people mm -hmm. on an email string that is negative. Raise your hand if you've ever had that experience. Boy, I have seen it. I can't tell you. And I have to say, it's really diminished. I haven't, I used to, when I was president, I would get these internal league squabbles. And people would send me emails with like 20 back and forth with, you know, 25 people on the email string. And I think we are, as a society, beginning to learn how to use email better. And, and one suggestion that I would make is never send something out that's negative in an email. Mm -hmm. If you want to give constructive criticism, pick up the phone and talk to someone. Don't do it by email. Because we are all 
sensitive on the insides. And definitely, you know, the old adage, what is it? Criticize in private, compliment in public. That is really true. So if you have something to say, like, Corinne, that was the best presentation I've ever seen, yes, send it to her whole board. But if there's something that you want to privately say to somebody, just pick up the phone and use one-on-one -on -one communication. So let's talk now. I'm going to ask you to stand up again and volunteer again. The attributes of leaders that you haven't liked working things that really annoy you and make you want to say, I don't want to do that. It's not worth it to me anymore. This is no fun. And I just want one or two words. We don't want editorials here. So this time I'm going to start with Teresa in the back. You don't have to introduce yourself, but just the one or two things that really turn you off from people working with Here's a brief example. You really should be doing such and such. Well, why don't you help us with that? I can't do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that the leader should be willing to roll up their sleeves. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. 
Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting to hear that list. I, I would say that the micromanaging, which I had down three times, uh, did everybody get a chance? We skipped around a little to talk. Okay. So um, the, the micromanaging is an issue that I often hear complaints with, that the, the president is, you know, not letting me do my job. You know, this is my job. She, she or he needs to let me do it. And so there's a thin line between following up and encouraging and micromanaging. And that's something that sometimes, you know, I know we have some new presidents. Robin is one, she's a new president of Sanibel. Sarah's a new co-president of Marge. Do we have anybody else who's newly in the president's role? So it takes time with any new board for things to, it's a new set of relationships. And there are going to be issues and difficulties. And it, it's always important to communicate, to, to, if something is bothering you, Remember, we're not getting paid a salary for this. Talk to your president or talk to the person and tell them that this is bothering you. What can we do? And it's always good to come in with a solution, but oftentimes it's good to let the leader or yourself as the leader see if you can figure out how to fix this. But do communicate because we are doing this as volunteers. So it should be pleasant and exciting and Fun. Fun is a word that should be part of our vocabulary. It should be fun and rewarding. Um, I also think that the, the other side, which is the lack of encouragement, is really important. And one of the things that I know of people that I've served on boards with is I love the board leaders who make a big deal out of recognizing people who have worked on something. You know, Joe Schmo raised 100000 for us for the ballet. He's been caught, you know, I mean, to, to make, to people love the sound of their own name. And they <laughs> really appreciate being recognized for their hard work and their accomplishments. So as a chair or as a volunteer and working in a committee or as president, you cannot do that too much. People love it. It makes them feel good and worthy and important. And this, you know, when you look at the pyramid of life, we're on the little tippy top. The bottom of that Maslow's hierarchy is food, shelter, relationships, <laughs> safety. Volunteer work is that little cherry on the top. So if it's not fun, and it doesn't make us feel good about ourselves intrinsically, we're going to replace it with something else. That other, you know, you only have so much time, and I can't believe how much time all of us do donate and contribute to this organization, what we do. But it's important to make each other, even if you're not the president or the chair, to give positive feedback and say, I was so proud sitting in the audience when you spoke to the legislature. I, I was just so proud to watch you and what you were able to do and how articulate you were. Just as a fellow volunteer, that makes that person feel so, so good. And, and it elevates you as a leader. It elevates you as a leader because you are encouraging somebody else to give even more effort and energy. So that's a very important attribute. Thank you for sharing all of those. Okay, now I'm going to hand out a checklist that I've put together for over the years. Thank you. And here, you can just make sure everything gets on. Uh, one, let me go through. And these are tips um, for how to make your lead more effective. And I'm going to go through this super fast. So if you have a question, raise your hand. One of the most important, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, the state lead helps local leads pay for constant contact if they don't have it and can't afford it. Why? Because it is a leverage tool. The more people that you can reach inexpensively, and obviously letter is a thing of the past unless you're fundraising, the more people you can reach quickly and cost effectively, the more power you have as an organization, the more success you're going to have. So your database, your local lead database is very important, and it should include members, it should include business cards from everybody you need. Put that in an email. We now have more than 25,000 emails in the state league. 
That's very powerful. Very powerful when we send out action alerts. You need to do that at your local league level. And you should be collecting the emails of all your media. Every time you meet a TV producer, reporter, investigator, Sarah knows this, but she used to work for the Orlando Sentinel, writer, get their emails and put them all in and communicate with them as well so they know what you're doing. Uh, make sure your board is full. You, once you've had your annual meeting, you usually have six spots, five or six <coughs> spots that the board and the president can appoint. Fill those. And look for people who are new or may not even be lead members. I put on a couple of people on the state board who were not even league members. Alex Villalobos, who was a Republican legislator, not when he was still uh, holding office. Lisa Hall, who was a PR professional up in Tallahassee. And I think there were, well, Paula Dockery. I asked Paula to be on the state board. She was not, well, she was an, I think she was a league member in Polk County, but not an active one. Had never served on the board and had just knew us because we used to call on her when she was in the Capitol as a senator. So look outside for talent, for people who have great contacts and you think believe in what the league does. And then it's your role as a leader to mentor those people so they are fully up to speed with speaking with one voice, the nonpartisan elements, and how we work with study and action. Those are elements that you as a leader really need to make sure you communicate in your board orientation. And diversity. One of the things that I've seen at the National Convention is how the league is moving in terms of its membership. And that's not the same direction we're moving in Florida. Florida, I think, is taking pride in being a very diverse league of women voters, all different ages, all different colors, and all different political perspectives. The more diversity we have, the more credibility we have with different groups and our elected officials. And there is a wonderful book called The Wisdom of Crowds, which really quite a surprise. You would think if you've got like a physics professor and you put it up with a kind of, you know, they always joke about how committees make decisions. The committee of diverse people always comes up with the right answer ahead of the individual expert. So when you get a diverse group of people who have different backgrounds and you encourage them to give and to disagree with each other and give input, you get some really, really good output. And that's how we come to studies, is we study issues and we have diverse viewpoints and we come to really sensible solutions. Calendar. A lot of leagues don't do it. It really is important. Do a calendar for when your annual meeting is, when you have to send in your issues that you want the state board to do, when you're going to send out your annual fundraising letter so you can raise money from your local members, which will bring in two, three, four thousand dollars just like that by sending out a letter. All of those things need to be in there. Do an annual fundraising mailing. Raise your hand if your league sends out a letter once a year asking for money. So easy to do. So easy to do. Just put it on the calendar and do it. Letter from the president with what we've accomplished and what we're going to be focused on. Please give. And you will get checks. They'll just flow in. It's a lot easier than putting on a fundraiser. Unless you want to do that. Have a great website and Facebook page. How many of you have a lead Facebook page for your local league? I hope everybody. Those are so, you don't have one? <laughs> Well, that's a really, and we and the state office can help you, and we have volunteers who can help you do that. It's very, very easy to do. And then you have to push it. You know, you have to hawk it and get people. I think we have three or 4,000 on the state league Facebook page. So, and you know, typically, yes. Um, back to number one, uh, you, did you say to, that we should send out, as a, as a county league, uh, blasts? Yes. And there are a lot of leagues here that do it. Seminole does it, Orange does it, Jacksonville does it, Tallahassee does it. <coughs> I get them because they are, every time they have a hot topic, they'll send out three or four reminders. Uh, every time, if there's something that's just happened, 
But they, I mean, they can do press releases on local issues just like the State League does where we send them out with president statements and things. And you should. The more people see that, that's the only way to get it in the paper and on the news. So you should be using that. Um, how many of you have a professional headshot? Used to. Anybody? Get that headshot. Get the scarf around your neck and the boat pin. It costs like 15 bucks at Walgreens. Why should you have it? Well, as president, you definitely need to have it because you want to have your picture on your website with your bio. You want people to know who you are. But even if you are a, a volunteer or a chair or a president, you hopefully will be writing letters to the editor or opinion pieces. It's important to have that headshot to go with the article. People like to get that. And I really like to see pictures of board members on websites because it humanizes what is otherwise a very kind of cold looking, policy wonkish website. So get your pictures taken. How many of you call into the monthly leadership calls that Pam has? Okay, well, if you're a president or on the board, you should be doing it every month because that's a lot of important information that is shared and for you to share. It's a place for you to make suggestions and give feedback. Um, measurable goals. How many of you set a measurable goal for yourself? Good. That's, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask what it is, but that's a good thing because we know that corporations look have measurable goals, and some organizations have them. I know the State League has them. They set goals for membership, for money raised, for Facebook likes. And that's a good thing for your board to do, is to start the year and say, OK, we have X, we have 200 members. What do we think we'd like to get to? And then if everybody works together to set that goal, they're going to work harder to reach it. So maybe that's a goal you set with your membership at the annual meeting or at a hot topics, but set measurable goals because they're so rewarding when you reach them. Like making Florida number one in solar. Imagine how good we're gonna feel when we have the most solar installations anywhere in the country. We're gonna have a party! <laughs> okay, solid financial footing. Everybody who's on a board should give a check to their local league, everybody. That is fiscally responsible. If you're asking your members to give money to your league, you should be giving whatever you can afford. It can be $5 or it can be $1,000, but give something. This is a group, we give a lot of time, I know that, but you, it's important to give money too because we need money to do some of the things that we do. And lastly, we talked about this before, delegate tasks to others. Don't try to do it all yourself. You remember I talked about that fire inside you? You don't want to burn it out and have this big smoke go up and you're like, that's it, I'm done. I burned <laughs> myself up, I'm done. You have to preserve your energy and your time by delegating to others and they want to help you. So when people do come with suggestions, don't say, no, I don't have time. Say, that sounds interesting, I'll bring it to the board. Would you be willing to chair it? Right? And by the way, that really separates the wheat from the chaff. <laughs> no, I just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> I don't have time. So, um, but often people will say, yes, I'd love to. I really would. And because it's their idea, they'll take ownership over it and run with the ball. So any questions on the checklist? Yes. No, don't be on that. Um, well, and something we've been talking about in my board is to have some kind of a retreat where we can uh, get to know each other better, kind of uh, bond better, maybe, like you say, make, make some goals for our league. Do you yes. have any kind of off-the-cuff suggestions of activities? I do. Susie, thank you for asking that. I have two <laughs> suggestions Yay. for orientation. One thing is the one thing I find is it's very easy to work with people over the years and not know them, and it really is important. And, and one of the beautiful things about the league is the friendships that that you will find when you get created. But as as a leader, you have to encourage that to happen. So one, I mean, there are all kinds of icebreakers, and I'm sure you you have other good ones. But one that I've used is to say, okay, we're going to go around the table. This is when you have a little bit of time, and everybody is going to tell what kind of spice they are. 
<laughs> you know, I'm cinnamon, I'm garlic, you know, whatever it is. And, and they always have a reason, and it's a way of them expressing their personality. The other icebreaker that I like to use is to have everybody choose a partner and talk to them for about three or four minutes, because then the person they spoke to is going to introduce them. Here's what I want you to know about Sarah Isaac. You know, she grew up here, and she went to Cuba there, and she speaks fluent Spanish, and she's a marketing professional. It's much more concise <laughs> when somebody else is introducing you, because if you have someone introduce themselves, it, first of all, it's a hard thing. And that was an exercise, actually, I was going to ask everybody to do, because it's an important thing. But uh, that's a fun icebreaker, because then you're having that conversation. Um, so that was one thing. And to repeat the question, Susie, that was the icebreaker, but there was another component of it. Um, well, oh, oh, okay, at, at the orientation. The other thing that I always started my orientations with is to give everybody an index card on my board and say, what are you passionate about? What do you want? What would the headline read for your involvement with the league and the league at the end of your term? And that's something elected officials should think about. What do I want my legacy to be with this organization? Because if my passion is environment, and I am asked to be the bylaws chair, that may not be a good fit. And believe it or not, there are people who want to reform the bylaws. Oh, yeah. That's their passion. So you have to, the first step is finding out what drives people. What ignites the flame in them. And every, you will be, and it is so much fun, because there's so often there are surprises. You know, I want to leave this league a diverse league. I want to leave this league having four young people on the board and 40% young people in our membership. I want to reform the Charter Review Commission for Seminole County. Whatever it is, people lie, we lie awake at night and we worry about these things. You think about what is your core passion. Well, everybody in your organization is there usually not because they're a great bridge player, it's be, and they may be, but because they care about public policy issues. And they see the league as an amazing leverage and platform for them to make that happen. So that's a great question, Susie. I think we had another question. Was it you, Corinne? It wasn't a question, but I, well, I, it had to do with financial things. Mm -hmm. Money is ready to be spent. I find there are a lot of leagues that are holding on to the purse. Yes, and that is was in Jack Benny's face. You know, <laughs> they, they don't understand that they raise it to spend it. They hold on. Okay, I think that is a very, I, I do see that. You, you know, really, ideally in a nonprofit, you should spend almost everything you raise. Exactly. But it is good to put some, you know, oh, to your oh. to your trust fund. But they don't. But, but a lot of leagues are so tight on that money, you'd think they were you know, sending their kids to college on it. Spend the money, spend the money. Um, and we have recently, I was at an annual meeting where there were a number of questions regarding you know, $100. And, and the point is that the person who had spent this money had made major legislative changes in the state. So you really have to weigh, it's good to spend the money. It's good to spend the money, and we need, we're not very good at it. We're not very good, frankly, at fundraising, and we're not very good at spending the money. So those are things we all need to work on. So I'm glad you brought that up. Robin. Well, I guess we're a, we're a tiny league. You know, we only really have 60 to 70 members every year, and we're a tiny little island. <laughs> so I guess, I guess a dilemma that I've noticed in the in short time that I've been involved with, with this league is that it's hard to get members to be involved and do things. And I, I, and I, don't, I don't think it's, well, it is, a, it is a board problem, but how do you get the membership? You know, it's like 20% of the people that do 80% of the work. Yeah. Just, that's how it that's is. That's a great it's question. And, and, and by the way, you say you're a small league, league, but you may no. be the largest league as a percent of your population. Oh, well, this is a good thing. Right, am I right? <laughs> yeah, we're pretty good. Okay, there. you're right. So you may be the largest league in the state as a percent of your population, yeah. and you just started five years ago. It was a brand new league, yeah. Sandella. And we're unusual because, yeah. well, we are unusual. Well, I don't know if it's unusual or not, but we, but everybody on this, in this place volunteers for things. You know, yeah. there's a million yeah. organizations that are nonprofits, 
and you know, and it's, so everybody it's true, you know, yeah. all our lives. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, you know, you it's it's. So how do you catch them to get them? How do you so I'm going to answer that. To do something. For I'm going to answer that. How many of your leagues have annual, not annual meetings, but planning meetings? How many of your leagues have a planning meeting? Who can tell me what a planning meeting is? Anybody? Go ahead. Well, I'm kind of new at this, but I think it's a great idea because you plan for the year what your priorities are going to be, and then you hopefully, that's what the state will vote for. Well, exactly, but it can be, it's more than just what the state is going to do, it's what your local league is going to do. I don't know if Sanibel has a planning meeting, but usually it's held in January, you know, kind of like New Year's resolutions. And you get together, and you say to your membership, what do you guys want to do? Okay, we're all together, we've got this really powerful organization with a great reputation, what are we going to do? And here's where a leader is really important, because you have to prepare, so you have a few people who are going to be coming up and speaking about things, whether it's civil citation, um, expanding solar energy, um, you know, I mean, there's getting health care, uh, immigration. immigration. I mean, there's so many issues, but as, as the president should and the board should really try to salt it to make sure there are already some ideas. But then you want to be sure you have a very genuine brainstorm. So if I have a white paper up here, I'm saying, okay, let's go around and again. I love that index card that everybody has to write down what they care about. You can do it before you start it. Or you can do it once you've done the brainstorming and you've got everything up there, and then you need to find out where the energy is in the room. How many people are going to put a card in on immigration? How many people are going to put a card in on civil citation? I know at the Orange County planning meeting, they had a, they, they went through everything, they got the ideas, they put them up on a board, and then it was like, raise your hand if you're interested. Sticker. Oh, you did stickers. Okay. You did stickers, which was great. Everybody got stickers, a limited number, and it was one, two, three, like green, yellow, orange. And so you put your sticker on your top three priorities. And then you could visually see where the energy was in the organization. And at the very end of that meeting, I remember somebody raised their hand and said, you know what I don't see up there? A need to diversify our league. We don't have enough African Americans and Latino. And so that came in at the end. Okay. And there's the top. What? And it moves the top. And it moved to the top. So this is the chance, you know, it's really important to have that conversation because I'm not going to work on something unless I really care about it. But it's a se you're talking about that this is a separate plan. It's a separate plan. The plan. membership is invited to it. Yes. To yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, when, not we start, board. when we start doing planning for programming and things like that, it gets lost because <clears> we have, you know, our meetings are two hours and then, then, then we're done and then everybody goes home. Yeah. So now this we is don't the, have, we don't because we're time. grassroots. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're grassroots. And if we are not working on things that our members care about, people are going to fall off. Right. That is what is going to build your organization, is people seeing progress on things that they care about. I mean, you think about the numbers of groups that are out there, but you belong to the League of Women Voters, and there's a reason for that. The League must have touched a chord with you on an issue or two or three or four or five that you care about, and you think that we're getting things done, which we are. But you have to give the grassroots a chance to speak and to volunteer, and it's a beautiful thing about how that works. If you raise your hand and say, I care about diversity, league or I care about cleaning up the St. John's River, you're probably going to step forward and work on it. I think that's how I found the forum. <laughs> you know, it's the people who raise their hand, who have input, who know something about it or who care deeply about it and want to know more. So that is the magic of the grassroots approach and that's why league members are willing to pay money to work their butts off for no money. Because we are touching the things they care about and helping them change the world. So that, that's, that was a very, very good question. And an annual meeting, now you're also unique because we have a lot of leagues that are year-round, and then we have a number of leagues. I don't know about Palm Beach, but I'm sure Sanibel, you know, everything gets quiet for like three months, right? Not for you. Palm Beach has Palm Beach. Well, you have a big year round, too.
But so, you know, so you have to figure the calendar, January, or you know what, maybe September is a good time to do your annual meeting, because that's the beginning of your active year. I don't know, and that this isn't the time or place to figure that out, but it's important to have a grassroots plan meeting so people can share what they care about. And I like the index cards also because a lot of people, as outgoing as league members are, and I you know every single one of you had no problem standing up and sharing. It's nice to have to think, what do I really care about? What, do, what, what would I work on? And then get those index cards with your name on it and the president and the board can go through it. Yes, I'll, and I'm gonna come to you, Lori. Right. Yes, I, I thought when we do ours in February and the snowbirds are still there and they can be a part of it and then when they go home, they give them something to work on. Yeah, they can sure. work from far. Sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, any, yes, and no wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's important to take a vacation. Sure. It really it is, even from something that we care about so much. I was just going to say that um, the Orange County model that you described briefly with the boats, um, an example of how well it works and how fair it is, is that um, a bunch of people voted for fracking as their first priority. Um, not last year, but the year before last. And really, the league is really taking yeah, they, they, they do it. Yeah. And anybody that doesn't know what track is, come up to me. Yeah. So that's a very good point. Yes. Bring up the issue of coalitions. Coalitions. The coalitions are very important. One of the things that I've observed over the years as a state leader is that it is really important to build and develop coalitions and good relationships with your partners. And it's really quite amazing and fun to see us work on the solar amendment with the Tea Party and the Christian Coalition, which are not typical partners for us, but they believe very strongly in energy independence, and it was a great opportunity for us to partner. We keep looking for an opportunity to partner with the James Madison group up there in Tallahassee because it's important to have communication channels with these people. Every year, I would go in and see Mark Wilson, who was the president of the Florida Chamber of Commerce, who usually works against everything that we support, because it was important to have a relationship with him and to be able to pick up the phone. And when Tabor came, I went in and saw him, and I said, Mark, where are you guys on Tabor? Can we ask you to hold back? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. they didn't do anything on Tabor. Now, was it because the league asked them not to? I don't know, but it didn't hurt that we, we don't vilify them. We ask them nicely, and we have a relationship. So I have to say, even if there are people in your county or city that you think, well, I couldn't believe it, that uh, I was just reading the morning paper about Boner, Boehner calling <laughs> about 70% of them said advocacy. But about 
about 98% of what the league does nationally is education. We have a lot of leagues that they'll put on candidate forums, they'll have hot topics, they don't advocate. And for me, and I think for all those people who said they like advocacy, that's why I'm so excited about the league, because they're a trusted, nonpartisan voice who is unafraid to speak out. And we have all these studies, it's like an Encyclopedia Britannica, of stuff that we can use to advocate for. And the league state board and the league local boards are really brave. They're willing to stick their neck out. We always have to find a position, you know, in our study and action to base it on. But the courage of the league is incredible. And to have that loud and intelligent, concise, well-drafted citizen voice makes all the difference in the world. So as leaders, and this is what really excites people, most of us, is the advocacy. Go for it. And don't just do state issues, do local issues too. I know in Orange they're working on trying to stop a big development uh, that would go into a very rural part of the county. You've got issues in Hillsborough with transportation. They're all kind of, you've got civil, the juvenile justice. These are things we can have press conferences. We can send in editorials with your headshots. These are things, <laughs> <laughs> these are things we, we need don't want to, to do. <laughs> Very, very important. And you know what? It brings members in. It fires members up. When we did a moratorium on voter registration, I must have gotten 15 calls from around the state people. Corinne remembers this when they said, I, I would like to be arrested. Could I go ahead and do voter registration anyway and be arrested for not turning it in in 48 hours? And I said, We, we actually talked to our attorneys about that. Would that be, you know, kind of like the uh, Susan B. Anthony being carried off to jail? No, the attorney said that it's just we're not going to get that photo up, and it, it, it doesn't look good to be the you know lawbreakers on this. We we think we can win in the courts, and we did. But the point is that league league members they have that blood running through their veins. They're ready to be disruptors, so that's good. And you want to foster that in your local league, but you want to base it on sound sound research. And I do want to go back to the relationship building. You want to be able to go to those county and city commissions. And they know you're reasonable, thoughtful people because they've shaken your hand and they've sat down with you. You've been polite, you've been respectful, but you can disagree and you can urge them to do things. All right, any other questions? Because then I want to do some exercises in the time we have left. I just think that's such an important point that you brought up advocacy. And I think that the more you, you build coalitions, with like people or pe not necessarily like people, but they see that advocacy and it develops them into that advocacy. Yes, it does. It's really the advocacy is really an exciting component. And so I would suggest local leaders look for opportunities where you can make a difference. Bill Gates said the most important thing when you start to make a change is to think about what you can really reasonably accomplish. Is this something that's changeable? This is something that you can impact, and obviously at the local level, it has to be a local issue, although Lindy brought up the example of fracking, and when we hear from our local leagues that they care about a state issue, we can get involved at the state level. But it's important to have local league advocacy efforts as well, whether it's going to your county commission and saying, we need more low-cost health care for our working people here. You know, that, that kind of a message. The league has a long history in doing that. Over the years, they've gotten libraries started, you know, changed the configuration of school systems, done all, started pre-K, all kinds of things. So look for those opportunities that you can measurably change. Any other questions? Okay, here's our exercise. I find it really important. How many of you have ever done Toastmasters or public speaking course? Mm -hmm. Okay, two of you. Okay, okay, a few. This is the deepest fear that most people have, is standing up and speaking with a microphone. And one of the things that is the most common problem is because people really don't want to talk into the microphone. They, they don't want to keep their mouth closed. So what we're going to do is we're going to take turns. We're going to, one by one, we're going to come up here, and I want you to practice putting your mouth very close to the mic so we can 
loudly. You can use soft tones. I don't use soft tones a lot. Just modulate your voice. And all you're going to do is come up and introduce yourself, make eye contact with everybody in the audience, and tell us your name, why you joined the league, or you know what was it that got you into the league, and if you have that index card that I talked to you about, what would you like your legacy with your league work to be? Now keep in mind, we're not looking for a PhD dissertation. Do I have a timer? I think it'd be good to have a timer. Everybody gets one minute or less because there's about 20 of us in here. So this is your chance to practice, have fun. The more you speak to people from the front, the more fun you get to enjoy it. But the reason this is important is we need to do this a lot. We need to be comfortable on our feet speaking to county commissioners. And if you can talk with a microphone, it's really easy to talk without it. But if you ever get a chance to talk into the mic, make sure you do it and stand up, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you're going to stand up, introduce yourself, what brought you into the league, and the one thing that I would really like to leave as my legacy is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a time to think about that. And you know what, instead of going down, you know, like I did before, I'm going to ask for a couple volunteers to start. Anybody feel ready? All right, Sarah, thank you. And so I want you to move around, not be stiff, don't take the fig leaf. You ever heard of the fig leaf stance? As this one woman who's a professor in public education, she said, use real estate. Don't be afraid to use real estate. Spread out. You watch men. They, they spread out. You know, women are like, Okay, I'm <laughs> Use your real estate. Hi, I'm Sarah Isaac with the Orange County League, and the reason I got into the league is I used to be a reporter, where I often saw a lot of things about what was going wrong, but we were always in the back of the room reporting about it, and I wanted to get into the front of the room and do something about it. Um, and the one legacy I want for my league is that we become a diverse, dynamic voice in a much too, uh, right now, um, divisive uh, political environment. Great, thank you. Great. Next, that was good. All right, now you find your next person and hand the mic over. And coming now is... <laughs> My name is Lorraine Koss, and I have a career in water policy working to save local water bodies, which is how I became involved with the League. Throughout my career, there have always been connections because that was the one group that could really be in the grassroots and make it happen. My legacy will be Florida's son. And here comes a whammo. <laughs> my name is Robin Cook, and I am the newly inducted president of the Sanibel, Florida League of Women Voters. And the reason that I got involved with the League is I have a very rich and varied past of volunteer work, and I also was involved on my, uh, my city's uh, city council and planning commission up in Minnesota, in Wyzetta, Minnesota. So I had to be interviewed at various forums by the League of Women Voters, and they were wonderful, and I was very taken with them. And when we moved down here permanently, I said, what can I do? I have to do something, and I'm going to join the league. And I did, and I got to the table, to a board meeting, and they said, so what are you doing next year? I said, and they said, do you want to come on the board? And I said, yes. So that was only a year and a half ago. What I want to do is leave the Sanibel League a little larger than before, a little to do more advocacy work, to increase our marketing efforts, and to increase what we can do for the city of Sanibel as well. Thank you very much. Here comes. This is such a smart group. It's a, a, a great thing to get all this great advice. I'm Lindy Freeman. I think I joined the Orange County League maybe three, four years ago. Uh, because I was working out in a class with Michelle Weavey, and um, we started talking about uh, her work with the League, and I went to an amendments um, 
training session. I didn't know how to vote on the amendments because of the way they're written. And um, my interest was not environmental in my career as a clinical social worker, but when I got to uh, unincorporated Seminole, um, let's just say that we were stupid in buying a home with lousy well water, and no one had ever organized the whole community to, um, to get piping. And that's how I ended up on the Natural Resources Committee of the Orange County League, um, where at the time the focus was um, good water. And by good, I mean safe, safe to drink. And um, I've learned a great deal about my project that I'm doing from being in the league, and um, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And your legacy? I hope my legacy will be succeeding with the piping for 116 well water homes. And this is Miss Deborah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Deborah Mishley. Um, I'm in the Space Coast League. I have been a trailblazer all my life. I've been in building materials, construction building materials, and I have a degree in cement and concrete technology back in the 70s. And I stayed in it for my career and I was an executive and it's been a fight ever since. Um, and the thing that draws me to League is the fairness that they want to bring and the voice of the fairness and reason. The education is, is a great part of it, but you have to have the advocacy behind it along with the fairness and the education. So. Um, what I would like to do with the League is use my passion, that's my legacy, to use my passion and inspire others to speak up, stick with it, uh, and, and as a group we can get things done. Hi, I'm Liz Johnson and I am a fairly new member of the Hillsborough County League. Uh, I am the treasurer nominee for the new year, and I'm really excited to be involved. Um, though I am going to come in as the treasurer, I would like to have, oh, how I got involved with the league. My dad. My dad's Marty Sullivan here in the uh, Orange County. <laughs> and, and my mom, Laura, is also um, involved with the Orange County League, and, and uh, my dad saw me getting really involved in some transportation issues that we have down in Tampa and he said, you know, you really need to join the league. You need to get involved with the league because they have a lot of power. And that leads me into what I want my legacy to be in Hillsborough County and that is I want to work with our league and partners and take a lot of information that I've learned here today to increase our voice in Hillsborough County, to be as large a county as we are and to have a fairly small membership roster is surprising to me, and I really want to increase our voice in that area specifically. Who's next? I'm Theo Webster, and I'm a, a new board member for the Orange County League of Women Voters. Um, you know, my knowledge of the League of Women Voters goes back to when the League used to do the, uh, moderate the presidential debates way back when. <laughs> um, recently, when I retired from the city of Orlando as the theater manager for the Bob Carr Performing Arts Center, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you go to the League and I'll treat you to a Hot Topics. So, I went to the Hot Topics, and they were at the time starting a study on money and politics, which I was interested in. So I participated in that study, uh, went on, I became involved with the open primary study. I'm, a, I'm doing a lot of different things now, but um, so that's over the last year and a half, and it's just kind of moved. I like that the league is able to Accomplish things. Gotta be quick. Gotta be quick. Legacy. Your legacy. It's hard to choose from all the issues, <laughs> but, but I think healthcare, healthcare for people, is what I'd like as my legacy. 
Tennessee. I'm Maura Smith, and I'm a retired, I'm still a lawyer, but I'm a retired judge. And four years ago, when I hit retirement, my husband, Marty Sullivan, let's hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> he um, got me involved, and every year, you know, at all the events, everyone was standing next to each other, and people say, oh, we see your wife got you involved. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> uh, what I, got passionate about most of my career was juvenile issues, and I have to say, I got burned out and disillusioned, and frankly gave up, um, after everything I've seen. Um, but I, we got into the league, I got most energized working with Carol Davis on voter registration issues. I would love to see the league fulfill its main original purpose, and, act, and I don't know if it's possible, but to actually make a huge increase in registration of voters, which is still minuscule. And if I could believe that we could make a big difference for children, I could be very passionate about that. Who's next? Thank you, Lord. And I've been in Florida for three years now, from Alaska. <laughs> and um, I have to say that our, our speaker, um, I used to listen to you on MSNBC, and I was so excited about your ideas about getting people involved in voting. And <laughs> I, I have many passions. One is voting, and I think people that have been in prison when they're out, they should vote. And I, I think that's a terribly important thing. Voting is a right for every single person. I'm very impressed with getting the immigration problem solved. <laughs> this has gone on much too long. We have to do this. And I, I find that the International Committee is kind of great, too. So I, there's just so much to do with the League. And um, when I first started, I don't know how they got my name. But it came from the national, and I, I was paying and paying. But I'm, a, I was a, a nurse. I'm a retired nurse, public health, and I uh, ran the Title X uh, Women's Health and Family Planning since its inception. So um, for 35 years. So, so I really believe in helping Planned Parenthood. In the 60s, I taught in the South Bronx, one of the first to fire fires, uh, fire, uh, homicides, and... Uh, uh, and we don't have time for long introductions. Not long. brought into the league and the legacy. Yep. Okay, so I was involved in the civil rights movement there uh -huh. in the 60s. Homicides, fires, homicides, and thefts. Okay, then I came to Florida in um, 2006. And when the league couldn't do voters, I got involved with OFA, and we took over the registration of voters. And the way I look at it, I just, uh, I find that Florida is vile. The needs for the voices of so many people and, and issues is overwhelming. Um, so I went to a meeting, I smiled, and I became in charge of voter registration <laughs> in Delray Beach. And then, like Ben said, you get to join the league too. And uh, I'm a soldier, I'm a fighter. And um, to pick a legacy, I just hope to move all the issues that I work on ahead. I work with like, ending sex trafficking. Um, even before joining with Patty, I was doing um, gun, sensible gun safety uh, regulation um, among four committees on the league advocacy and. Voting Rights Coalition and voter service. I mean, it goes on and, and, and the environment. The Yankees are in Lincoln and, and our county is a very precious area that's just been going to be killed by a thousand cuts. Okay, so my legacy is just to keep moving it along. Good. Yay. Hello, everybody. I'm going to get nice.
the issue found me. I love being in the lead. My le legacy, well, two things. Common sense gun legislation. Mm -hmm. I do believe in dreaming big. A lobby that will be more powerful representing gun safety than the NRA. Yeah. Yeah. and I'm an accidental member of the week. Ask me about the story sometime. I wanted to be last because I want to talk about Speakers Bureau. We're going to have a workshop on Speakers Bureau, and one of our techniques in finding speakers is not to wait for volunteers, but to listen to people as they present in our own weeks. You have a couple of winners in this group, and I hope they're all going to be speakers. What do I hope for the league in the future? I hope it lasts a lot longer than I've been a member. I've been a member almost 60 years. I was very young. <laughs> uh, and I hope that it accomplishes all the things we want. I hope that not only do we register the most, the largest number of people, but we register people who know about government and civics. Yay! Corinne has been one of my mentors over the years. She's got, and I'm sure anybody who's ever met her feels that way. She's really been wonderful. And that part of being a leader is helping people get the skills they need. So I'm going to wrap up with two really short stories. I, I actually, I was so impressed with everybody's presentation because this is a hard thing to do, to stand up. And uh, I think the more you do it, and you ever see people do this and that, Get used to doing that and move around and move up to people. How many of you ever volunteered in classrooms? Okay, what I notice about teachers is, particularly if somebody's talking, what they'll do instead of chastising them, they'll come up and they'll just touch their shoulder and like, stupid, like this. <laughs> so, you know, you just kind of get right in and you connect. And as a speaker, you also can tell when people have had enough because they start fidgeting. But moving around, not staying locked in a place, not staying hidden behind the microphone, staying, using your arms, and using your real estate. I always thought that was a great description. So my two stories to wrap up. And I, I, I really loved hearing everybody's passions and legacy, and you need to think about it and dream big. Because if we don't dream big, we'll never get there. But as Who's that guy on TV? Dr. Phil, he says, a, a dream, a goal without a plan is just a dream. So it's important to have that goal, but you better have your plan. And the league is here to help you do that. So my two quick stories. One is, we all know the story of how women got the vote. But did we know that it wasn't actually Susan B. Anthony that carried the football to the final goalpost? No, it was a young attorney called Alice Paul, who was young, she was radical, and she had some such exciting ideas that the suffrage group really didn't want much to do with her because they thought she would be embarrassing. She wanted to pick at the White House, and she wanted to have a march in Washington. So you have to see the movie Iron Jawed Angels. My point in telling you this story is that a lot of times you work as a big group, and you work, and you work, and you work, and then a new champion will show up. Make sure you're always open to those new groups, new people, because it was the radicalism of, of uh, Alice Paul, who was very young, trained attorney, who was able to take all the work that the suffrage champions had done all those decades and finally able to make it happen. And it was a 24-year-old young man that cast the final vote, because otherwise it was tied and it wouldn't have happened. So a 24-year-old Harry T. Byrne, who listened to the telegram his mother sent us saying, Harry, be a good boy, do the right thing, get <laughs> women the vote. So young people are very important. And now we talk about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. She was the famous woman who wrote the book. Anybody read it? River of Grass. And so she was in the supermarket one night down in the Miami area, and she runs into an Everglades activist, and she says to the woman, thanks for carrying the fight on. You know, we, it's, we, we 
can't ever give up. And the woman says, Marjorie, what are you doing? Marjorie was 74. She said, well, you know, I wrote the book, right? River Grass wrote the book. <laughs> and the woman said, Marjorie, we need you to keep working. We need you to speak. We need you to write editorials. We need you to go to Tallahassee. Well, Marjorie pulled on her sub hose. She put on those thick glasses and her big hat and her cane and finally in her walker. She died at the age of 104 after her most active years of life were spent as an activist trying to protect the Everglades. So it always gives me goosebumps, the real life stories, but all of those people are sitting in your seat with your bottom and you're the person who can carry the ball across the finish line. But you have to have that passion, which I know you all do, which is why you're spending your Friday morning here. So let's get started. Thank you for coming this morning. You guys did a great job. Thank you so much.